Greetings, everybody. I'm Pastor Joshua Sullivan at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Kerrville, Texas. Welcome back to another episode of ATP, Ask the Pastor. Today, somebody writes, Dear Pastor, are we to consider other denominations as part of the church? While I agree confessional Lutheran theology is the best and most historic Catholic teaching, I feel it would be overreaching to say that we are the only true Christians out there. Yet, if we define the church as the gathering of believers, where the word is rightly preached and the sacraments are rightly administered, does that exclude all of American evangelicalism, who don't have a right understanding of the sacraments? All right, so Lutherans confess in the Augsburg Confession, Article 7, the church is the congregation of the saints in which the gospel is rightly taught and the sacraments are rightly administered. And we call those the marks of the church because where those things are, there you will find the church made manifest. Does this mean that Christians in denominations in which the gospel is not rightly taught and the sacraments aren't rightly administered, does, does that mean that those aren't churches in the scriptural sense? And what about those people that worship in them? Are they true Christians? And the answer is yes and no. Those assemblies are churches insofar as they retain enough of the gospel and the sacraments to convert sinners um, into children of God. However, those assemblies are also sects insofar as they stray from the truth of the gospel by teaching falsehood. And the same is true for the people in the pew. Those who hear God's word in those assemblies believe it and close their ears to the errors and falsehoods, the distortions that are being taught, they are true Christians. But those who believe the errors and the distortions of the gospel, uh, they can't have saving faith because they're believing a different gospel, which really is no gospel at all. So how is this possible? Well, God's word, when it's read publicly, is the word of truth going forth. And when God's word goes forth, it bears fruit. The Lord promises this in Isaiah 55, 11. He says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I send it. St. Paul says in Romans 10, 17, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So as long as the text of Scripture itself remains unharmed, then some in those assemblies when they hear the scripture being read, are going to be brought to saving faith by the Holy Spirit. The same is true for baptism as well. Churches that confess the Holy Trinity and apply water to people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're truly baptizing people. You know, even if that church denies um, the effects of baptism, the benefits of baptism, that baptism is still efficacious. They're just teaching people to misuse it or to, to not use it at all. Consider uh, most non-denom churches. You know, they deny that God regenerates sinners uh, and forgives sins in the waters of holy baptism. But as long as they remain Trinitarian and baptize according to Christ's institution, they retain the essence of baptism. Those who are baptized in those churches then... Uh, are truly baptized, and those who are baptized and believe what Scripture says about baptism and turn away from the falsehoods and distortions uh, that they add to Scripture, they not only are truly baptized, but they are also then enjoying the benefits of baptism because they're believing the simple words of Scripture that it's what it says about baptism. Now consider uh, the history of Israel, which is really just the history of the church. Um, Elijah, in his day, uh, thought the entire, in Elijah's day rather, the entire visible church was corrupted by Baal worship. So much to the point that the prophet can say to the Lord in 1 Kings 9, uh, 19 verse 10, I alone am left and they seek to take my life. And what did the Lord tell the prophet? He said, yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. That's 1 Kings 19, 18. So God himself testifies to Elijah that there are still true believers in the midst of an apostate church and apostate ministry. Same thing was true 
uh, though in a slightly different way, during the days of Christ and the apostles. Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 23, uh, verses 2 and 3, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. He also taught them in Matthew 16 to beware the leaven of the, Sadduc or of the Pharisees and Sadducees, which then was their doctrine. So the Jews were to hear the scribes and Pharisees when they read Moses in the synagogues every Sabbath, uh, whenever they taught Moses purely, but when the scribes and Pharisees mixed the leaven of their human traditions and corruptions with the heavenly teaching, then people weren't to follow them in that. Uh, they were to keep their faith pure from the alloy of false teaching. What we see in both of these examples is that God is able to produce uh, spiritual children for himself, even through a corrupt ministry. Even as the Lord himself says in Ezekiel 16, 20, he says, Moreover, you took your sons and your daughters, whom you bore to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. Now, all of this is why then there were, and still are, true Christians under the darkness of the papacy. The Roman Catholic Church has obscured the gospel with error, with falsehood, and yet, Johann Gerhard, writing in the uh, 17th century, noted, he said, Beside the codex of, Besides the Codex of the Bible, the Apostles' Creed has also continued to exist under the papacy. It is a summary of the chief and fundamental articles of the Christian faith. Also, the Decalogue continued to remain uncorrupted, as well as the Lord's Prayer, the account of the Lord's Passion, Baptism, the Sacrament of Regeneration, and some parts of the heavenly teaching. Who could possibly doubt that through these means the Holy Spirit was effectual in the hearts of some people for regeneration and salvation? But if some truly devout and believing people survived, surely the church survived too, which must be evaluated on the basis of faith rather than number. From this, it's clear then that the Roman church has enough of the gospel to convert sinners and make them children of God. Rome also, though, has enough false teaching to kill that faith which the Holy Spirit has awakened in them through the Word. For true believers in the Roman Church, then, saving faith is maintained despite the, church's, Rome, the Roman Church's false teaching, which can only tear down and attack the true faith in Christ. The same is true for the Reformed Churches. Uh, Calvin's Gospel, not the Scriptural Gospel, because in his opinion, God doesn't intend it for all men, only some. And that message can't create faith in one's heart because it engenders doubt that God wills the, speci the salvation of the specific, individual, the, the specific individual sinner. Yet in Reformed churches, uh, there are those who hear God's word read, re have received baptism, um, and believe the simple gospel, yet tune out the errors of the Reformed. The same can be said uh, for people in Arminian churches, people in Pentecostal churches, um, and really anything that fits under the umbrella of evangelicalism. Now, a word of caution is necessary at this point, though. Just because a church retains enough of you know, the, the essentials of the gospel and baptism doesn't mean that believers should be content with that. Rather, once a believer recognizes his church's errors, then it's necessary to flee that church for the sake of one's salvation. You know, false teaching isn't benign. Uh, it's not harmless. Error not only divides the church, but it also threatens the faith of the ones who imbibe it regularly. Like Paul says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Error spreads. It metastasizes. And as it does, it threatens faith because it tempts one into the complacency uh, light that, like Pilate, ultimately says, eh, what is truth? So rather than flirt with false doctrine or endure error or live with lies, St. Paul tells us, and all Christians in Romans 16, 17, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. And we avoid them for our sake, but also then uh, as a confession to them that they need to reconsider and repent. So I think understanding how churches in which the gospel is not rightly taught and the sacraments aren't rightly administered are simultaneously church and sect, I think that helps us make sense of the world in which we live. We can confess that in those churches, to the extent that they retain 
the essentials of the gospel and the sacraments, people are being converted, while simultaneously we can call people out of those assemblies to churches where the gospel is rightly taught and the sacraments are rightly administered. Hope this helps. We'll see you next time for another episode of ATP. Ask the Pastor.